Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Halloween Week. Today's video is going to be a little bit different because we're going to be doing my good old fashioned true crime get ready with me. Um, I know you guys really like this setup um, and figured I would bring it back for at least one of these days. Most of these videos just aren't long enough to like do a full uh, face of makeup on. This one really isn't even that long so I'm gonna do like my quick everyday type of beat thing and we're just gonna go ahead and dive right in. I want to apologize in advance. I am sick. I've been sick for like three weeks now and I'm a little congested and nasally and I'm probably gonna be coughing somewhat throughout this video so I do apologize but I've already filmed this video once and I really didn't like the way the footage came out so we're just gonna and do it all right so and as always all the products that I use in today's video will be listed down below along with some of my sources so today's video is on the murder of Martha Moxley Martha was 14 years old when she and her family moved to the picturesque town of Bell Haven Connecticut in the summer of 1974 this town was supposed to be their forever home with its perfect houses and exclusive yacht club and private roads patrolled by their own auxiliary police. However, just one year later, somebody in this picturesque town would brutally murder 15-year-old Martha Moxley. October 30th, 1975, Martha left her home with some friends to attend what was called Mischief Night, which was Basically, I'm sorry if you can hear my dogs. <sighs> Damn it. Um, so, Mischief Nice Night was basically a night of unsupervised fun that usually resulted in being a cover for underage drinking. At some point in the night, the group of friends end up at the home of Tommy and Michael Skakel. The Skakel family was the richest family in town but there was something else about them that made them much more well-known. They were actually Kennedys. Tommy and Michael's father, Rushton, is the brother of Ethel Kennedy, who is the widow of Robert Kennedy. The family was interesting, to say the least. They had some interesting uh, ways of going about their problems. Um, and one thing to note about Michael and Tommy is they had a very competitive and contentious relationship and they both had crushes on Martha Moxley. So Martha left her home October 30th around 7 p.m. Um, she was actually grounded that week but her mother decided to let her go anyways because she trusted her and loved her and just wanted her to have a little bit of fun. Um, and her mother later said that she kind of expected her to be home around 9.30, but there was no real time, again, because she trusted her daughter and she didn't want to, like, I guess put too many rules on her. Um, so she expected her home around 9.30, but it was kind of up to Martha about really when she would come home. However, after waking up around 2 a.m., Dorothy found that Martha was still not home and she grew concerned. Um, so she sent Martha's brother out to look for her. She also called around to some of Martha's friends that she knew she was out with. And this is when she learns that pretty much everybody that Martha was out with that night um, last saw her around 9.30 in the driveway of the Skakel home with Tommy. By 4 a.m., Martha is still not home and Dorothy decides to call the police to report her missing. Police didn't immediately canvass the area. They kind of went into this assuming, like police do with so many cases like this, that the um, child in question was a runaway. So they start asking the typical questions. Was there some sort of fight? Um, was Martha unhappy about something? Has she ever run away before? And the answer to this was all no. The um, Moxley family was by no means ultra rich or super well off but her father had a really great job that was supporting them in the lifestyle that they wanted and Martha actually had a very happy childhood there wasn't really too much fighting that happened in the home so it would be pretty much no reason for her to have run away 
I mean, just take that night, for example, she was grounded and her mother still let her go out because she wanted her to have fun and enjoy herself. That afternoon, while the friends and family of Martha Moxley were at the Moxley home waiting to hear some news, a neighborhood girl finds Martha's lifeless body underneath a nearby tree on the Moxley property. She had been beaten and dragged to the tree for cover. Now remember this is the 70s so the police really had no clue what the time of death would be. I think they said that it was sometime between like 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. Um, so pretty much useless. However, nearby they do find the weapon that was used on Martha. It was a TP branded golf club that had broken in multiple pieces during the assault. Police found two pieces of the weapon. However, they never found the actual handle, which really would have held a lot of DNA and fingerprint evidence that probably could have cracked this case wide open. This golf club had been used to savagely beat Martha across the face and head, and after it broke into three different pieces, the shaft was then stabbed into her neck which was actually the blow that killed her. And it didn't take long for police to realize that the golf club came from a set from the Skakel property. Apparently they had a golf course-like situation in their backyard and they actually kept multiple caddies of golf clubs across the property for some reason. I don't really understand it. It's probably a rich person thing. Um, but they soon realized that the club did come from one of those sets. Martha's murder was the first violent crime to happen in Bellhaven in 30 years, and it shook the town to its core. It would take 22 years for an official suspect to be named in Martha's murder, and another three after that for there to be an arrest. Tommy and Michael both had alibis for that night, though Honestly, they were shaky at best. Another possible suspect that police had to look into was 23-year-old Kenneth Littleton, who was um, recently hired as a live-in tutor and babysitter, basically, for Tommy and Michael by their father, Rushton, and he had actually moved in just hours before Martha's murder took place. The alibi for all three boys are very intertwined, so I'll kind of talk about them all together. And this might get a little confusing, so I'm going to try and dumb it down as much as possible. But there's a lot of moving parts here, <laughs> and a lot of names. So all three boys were said to have left the Skakel home around 7 p.m. with a bunch of friends and cousins. Um, they were going out to eat and to do other shenanigans, probably for mischief night. Um, and they arrived back home at around 8.45. And I couldn't really decipher when Martha ended up at the Skakel home, but we know she left her home around 7 p.m. And the Skakel home is actually like diagonally across the street from Martha's home, kind of like down the street, but across it a little bit. I'll put a map on the screen so you can kind of see a little bit better. Um, so at some point in the night, Martha ended up at the Skakel home, assuming after 8.45 when all three boys returned back to the Skakel home. Um, at this point, Kenneth says that he went inside to finish unpacking. Remember, he had just moved in that morning. Um, and then he wanted to relax in his bedroom and watch a movie that was supposed to be playing that night. Michael was supposed to have gone with his friends and cousins to drop everyone back at home. Um, however, there are conflicting statements about whether or not this actually happened. A friend of a younger Skakel child who was there that night for the party um, actually said that she swore in a testimony that uh, Michael did not get in that car for a second time and he was still at the, at the Skakel home when she left to walk home so that she could make her 9.30 curfew, so she would have left around like 9.20, and she stated that he was still at the Skakel home at 9.20. She also said that she last saw Martha alive when she left. She was standing in the driveway flirting with Tommy. 
in Tommy's original statement to police, he said that um, he last saw Martha at 9.30, just like everyone else. Um, however, in 1995, his father actually hired a third-party private investigator to um, basically try and clear his boys of any involvement. And Tommy tells this investigator that uh, he and Martha engaged in mutual masturbation, which it's just, I don't know why that like term sounds so gross to me, but it does. Um, and that she left walk home around 10 p.m. In 1995, Michael also admits to this third party investigator that he lied to police as well, and that um, he never went with his friends to drop everyone back off, but that he went to a tree outside of Martha's bedroom climbed up it, masturbated in it, and then went home. However, it was later determined that the tree that he described in the statement was actually the pine tree that her body was found under and was nowhere near her bedroom window. So that was a little odd. So I skipped forward a little bit because I am running out of the story. Um, so in 2001, Michael was arrested and charged with the murder of Martha Moxley. Two years later, he was convicted and sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. Friends and family of Martha finally felt vindicated. They truly felt that Michael was the one that murdered Ma Martha. Um, Martha's brother had spent years going over and over it trying to figure it out. He even spoke to Kenneth Littleton at one point and um, after Martha's murder, Kenneth's life kind of fell apart and for a while a lot of people think that it was guilt that kind of led him down a really dark path that he went down. He ended up becoming addicted to drugs and um, he got married and then divorced and I think lost custody of his kids and his life really went downhill really quickly after the murder and a lot of people truly felt that it was it was guilt that was making him kind of ruin his life um, but to this day Martha's brother um, will tell you he's done multiple interviews about it that he spoke to Kenneth and he had a long conversation about it and he truly just doesn't think that Kenneth was the one that did this um, the Moxley family truly believes that Michael Skakel is the one that murdered Martha. So after he was charged and sentenced to 20 years to life in prison, Martha's family finally felt that they had some sort of like sense of justice and vindication after all these years. Uh, the Mo Moxley family um, ended up leaving the Bellhaven area. It was just too painful to stay there. There were too many memories. Um, and too much darkness in their minds. And I would love to tell you that this is where the story ends. However, it doesn't. Like I said, Michael Skakel is a Kennedy, and this meant that he had America's royalty on his side. This case got a lot of media attention, way more than the case would have if it was just a normal murder case in Connecticut and people truly felt that there was absolutely no way somebody from this beautiful royalty type of family could have committed such a terrible crime. All of the living Kennedys um, did multiple interviews talking about how there was no way Michael could have done it, he was such a good boy. He was a kind and loving person. And eventually in 2013, a judge actually vacated Michael's sentence, saying that his defense attorney was inadequate and didn't put forth a good enough defense reasoning. And so they said that he never received a fair trial. It's really hard to do eye makeup while talking. So, Michael can technically be retried 
Um, however, the state has yet to say if that's actually going to be the case, and this was six years ago, so I hope they're taking this time to build an impeccable case against him and I mean even if it turns out not to be Michael I hope they're finding whoever did this but it's been six years and once again nobody has answered for the brutal murder of a 15 year old girl in the middle of Connecticut in her own yard this happened while she was walking home in it was in her yard the murder was brutal and savage and personal. It has been so many years and there's still nobody sitting in jail for this murder. After his sentence was vacated, Michael did an interview saying that he felt really bad for the Moxley family and he understood where they were coming from and that, you know, they deserved their pound of flesh. That was his specific words. They deserved their pound of flesh. It just isn't me. Martha's family is still doing interviews, still holding tight to the fact that they truly believe that Michael is the one that murdered their daughter and they will not rest until they see him back behind bars. I'm going to link down below a series that I watched in preparing for this video because it's really good. It's an in-depth look at like a, a re-examination of all of the evidence, all of the testimony, um, some absolutely heartbreaking interviews with Martha's family. It really just gives you a really, really good idea of the, the true severity of this case. So that is everything for today's video. I hope you guys liked this episode of Halloween Week. If you have any thoughts on this case, please remember to leave them down below. I love getting into discussions about these cases because they fascinate me. Um, if you have any recommendations for future cases, please leave them down below as well. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you're enjoying Halloween Week so far. But other than that, I will catch you guys in tomorrow's video. Bye!